Welcome to My Long Island TV, the show that features the people and events that make Long Island great. Members of the Long Island Press Club get an inside look at the secretive Long Island Animal Disease Center. The always outspoken Joan Rivers sits down to discuss her new book, Diary of a Mad Diva. The Brentwood High School Class of 1964 honors classmates that died during the Vietnam War. The best eight-year-olds battle it out for the top spot at the Farmingdale Baseball 9-11 Tournament Championship Game. Now let's get started. Hi, my name is David Nice. I'm the mayor of the village of Greenport. Welcome to my Long Island. On the east end of Long Island lies a misunderstood and mysterious place. There's a lot of stories about Plum Island and all of them are untrue. We're not doing secret work, we're not doing, we're not creating Montauk monsters, we're not working with alien technologies or Nazi scientists. We're, I mean, all of those rumors have been out there, but those are, those are all completely untrue. True or untrue, many Long Islanders are skeptical about what goes on in there. Everyone I said who I was coming to Plum Island was like, what, you going to Plum Island? You know, they gave me the old, <laughs> be careful, be careful. In order to ease this negative perception, the U.S. government has opened up Plum Island to the public. Today, members of the Long Island Press Club get the grand tour. The mission of Plum Island Animal Disease Center is to protect the nation from the introduction of accidental diseases where somebody could bring something in through an airport, or we protect the nation from the intentional introduction where somebody brought in something with the intention of harming our agriculture. We train the veterinarians that do those responses so that they can recognize those diseases. We uh, do the diagnostic work. So if there is a, animals with diseases that look, you know, that we don't recognize, we send the samples here and we do the testing for that. And then we have the vaccine banks to help respond to that. So we are part of the nation's response to an outbreak of a foreign animal disease. The primary virus studied at Plum Island is foot and mouth disease. It affects hoofed animals such as cattle, pig, sheep, goats, bison, and deer. The virus is inhaled by the animals and it settles in the lungs and throat where it quietly grows. By the time symptoms are visible in the hoof and mouth, it's too late for the animal, and too often, it's too late for the herd. A second disease being studied is African swine fever. When the virus infects domesticated pigs, there's a 100% mortality rate, and so far, there's no cure. None of the viruses studied at Plum Island are harmful to humans, but you can understand why the facility is on an island. The reason why we're on an island is for safety, not for secrecy. So we need to ensure that whatever diseases we're working with stay inside the containment facility. That's why we have these security procedures in place. Some of the security procedures to get on Plum Island include a background check, social security number, proper ID, and you can't be a foreign national. So all the areas what we call uh, considered single pass there, um, so it's never recirculated. The quick tour of the main building left most of us wanting more. We didn't get to go into the most complex and difficult research areas. We only got into the front door of the front door where we were given a detailed explanation of how careful they have to be to decontaminate everything. The bulk of our waste that comes out of biocontainment actually exits through autoclave. The rooms testing the viruses operate in a negative air pressure atmosphere. The air pressure outside the room is higher than inside the room. So when a door is open, air is sucked into the room and never blown out. As we drove around and took in the sights, we were informed that any deer that manages to swim ashore is euthanized by federal snipers. An infected deer could swim off the island and trigger an outbreak. Although we weren't allowed into the holding pens where the tests are being conducted, the tour still provided some surprises. To actually see the real island in its you know, regular scientific and technological glory of what it actually provides our government in juxtaposition of what I know of it from a fictional perspective was very exciting. I knew that there had been a fort there. 
but I didn't realize how big it was, and I didn't realize how extensive uh, the buildings were. I never realized the economic impact of animals on our agriculture and our uh, economy. An outbreak of foot and mouth disease in this country is estimated to cost $60 billion because one thing it does is it stops all your exports. So you can't, you can't trans, you, you know, you're not going to be able to sell any more pigs or cattle. Dairy products are all going to be stopped from going to other countries. That's going to cause catastrophic losses to our industries and also to our food supply. There are over 400 people working on Plum Island, but those jobs and the economic activity surrounding them will eventually be moved to Manhattan. No, not that Manhattan. Manhattan, Kansas. Because there are so many emerging diseases in the world that we cannot study in this facility, mostly because they are zoonotic. Uh, zoonotic means they, they can be transmitted from animals to humans. We can't study those in this type of a laboratory. We needed to have uh, biosafety level four capabilities to enable us to study these new and emerging diseases that are popping up around the world. We're probably looking at good 8, 10 years before we start even to think about transitioning the actual work to the new facility in Kansas. Uh, and it'll be a few years of transition before everything goes 100% over there. And at that point, once that lab is fully operational, then this lab ultimately will be shut down. Coming up next on My Long Island TV, the always outspoken Joan Rivers sits down to discuss her new book, Diary of a Mad Diva. We're the Freeport High School Corral, and you're watching My Long Island TV. I love Long Island. I love the whole area. And I'm thrilled to be here. I did a book previously to this one called uh, I Hate Everyone Started With Me, and that went very well. So my uh, my publisher called me and said, let's do <clears throat> another. And I said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, just write down your daily thoughts. So every day I picked up what I thought was funny that day or crazy that day. And that's what I did, and that became the book. The world is just full of material for you. Oh, you know, look around. Just that we're doing an interview and we can't turn the phone off. That would be an entry, you know what I mean? It, everything is in everything around. Everybody is so scared these days. They're so terrified to talk about anything. Everything is so politically correct that it is taking all the fun out of life. And I just never was that and refuse at this age to be part of that. And at this age, I don't have to be part of that. Are there any insights uh, about no yourself? No insights, no insights, nothing intelligent. You will come away with no life lessons <laughs> and you will say, why? Did I buy this book? But you will be laughing all the way through. Did it come easy to you? Nothing comes easy. Uh, no, but that's not, uh, that's just my job. I write and I rewrite and I write and I rewrite and I rewrite and I rewrite and I rewrite. And pages have to be pulled from me. If I was Shakespeare, I would have never gotten out of the comedies. There would have been nothing beyond the comedies. I write my own material for my nightclub. I write my own material for television. And I write my own material. So of course it's, it's one voice, which is good. I think you get into trouble when you write a book and it's not your voice. Uh, what they're getting is what I think is funny. And no matter where they pick me up, they're gonna get the same thing. Right after this, you're gonna go do a show for I'm what is it, an show. hour and a half? Yeah. What, yeah. what do you do? When, when I, is it gonna stop? Uh, why should it? Yeah, you're right, why should it? Why should it? But where do you get this energy? Some people just, you know, they don't have it. I, then that, I love what I'm doing and I think People that love what they're doing have the energy for it. People that, uh, what do they say, Matisse? Oh, when he, he had arthritis and he couldn't paint anymore. He learned to use a scissor and cut, cut. I mean, if you want to do something, you love what you do, you find ways to do it. There's nothing off limits? No. And Everything is funny. Everything, it, we live a life and what, if it's part of your life, then why should it be off limits? You're right. And, and never an apology. For what? Exactly. For I love what? that about you. I love that. For what? No apologies. No apologies. 
No, I, we're here to make you laugh. Winston Churchill, who I slept with. <laughs> Not that good in bed, but he was busy saving England. Uh, so I gave him credit, you know. Uh, uh, he said, every time you make someone laugh, you give them a little vacation. So I like to think of myself as the travel channel. Coming up next on My Long Island TV, the Brentwood High School Class of 1964 honors classmates that died during the Vietnam War. I'm Jane Pauley, your life calling, and you're watching My Long Island on Fios One. morning to honor our fallen classmates and those who attended Brentwood High School. Brentwood High School had 15 graduates die in combat in Vietnam. This is the class of 1964. It's our 50th reunion. We've come back to the school. We got the uh, Vietnam Memorial and that's uh, all the fellows that were in our classes that died in action in Vietnam and we're here to honor them. We will now proceed with the wreath laying it on the on the memorial. And I'd like Mr. Roland Jimenez representing the United States Navy. Back when we were 17, 18, uh, there wasn't too much going through our heads. But uh, one thing I wanted to do is, uh, if we were going to be drafted, I wanted to select a service that I wanted to, to go in. So I chose the United States Navy. These graduates never attended a class reunion. Their sacrifice was the ultimate sacrifice. And I'll now read the names. They're not in alphabetical order. They're not in the year that they graduated. They're in order of how they died, when they died. When you realize that uh, Brentwood is the largest school district on Long Island, you know, you just figure out the odds. If we have the most kids on the island, we probably had the most kids in the war, you know? And so odds are that uh, we're going to have the most uh, casualties. I was in communications, in the radio, so anything that happened in the military, uh, I usually was the first one on the ship to find out about it. And a lot of fallen classmates I found out about through the radio uh, messages that we got, especially uh, Eddie Labar, who was on the ship, the, the uh, Forrestal, and uh, also I was told about Gary Gwasp. I'd like all the veterans from the class of 1964 to please come up. I went in because it was something, as an American citizen, when I was called, I went. I gave no thought of, oh, I think I'll go to Canada. I went in and I uh, did the best I could and, you know, trying to be a good soldier. Richard Lancaster, class of 1960. Jose Vasquez. 1963. It's just immensely unfortunate, you know, and I feel for their families. They're just great lives snuffed out way too early. Uh, I'm glad that there's some recognition for them because uh, it, it's certainly well warranted. Edward Labar, 1964. James Seidensticker, 1965. One of the classmates in the year behind us in 1965, a young man named James Seidensticker, uh, got to Vietnam a little while after I did and was killed during the Tet Offensive in Saigon. And uh, this is my son James, who was named after James Seidensticker. And my wife Louise and I flew up from Florida to bring James with us and let him experience the, uh, the camaraderie of the people sitting here today, the, the veterans and Vietnam veterans, uh, and the service that they did, and he can understand a little bit about his namesake and where he got his name from. I'm an old Vietnam veteran who's free because of young men like you, and I appreciate your service very much. It's something I've been <clears throat> waiting to do for a long time, so today was uh, finally the opportunity to come up here. We're from Florida, so it was an opportunity to finally come up here and you know check it out and meet all these people. Peter Colucci, 1966. Frank Sardinia, 1965. Nicholas Fritz, 1965. Michael Chicucciolo, 1966. Gary Quas, 1964. Daniel Hummel, 1965. Joseph Funk, 1965. Lawrence Sultan, 
1966. David Skolnick, 1966. John Rosa, 1968. And Thomas Wynn, 1967. Coming up next on My Long Island TV, the best eight-year-olds battle it out for the top spot at the Farmingdale Baseball 9-11 Tournament Championship Game. Hello, I'm Gary Richard of PC Richard & Son, and you're watching My Long Island on Fios 1. Farmingdale Baseball League held its fourth annual September 11th Memorial Baseball Tournament. We stopped in to check out the action at the eight-year-old's championship game. Three, two, three! One, two, three! Three, two! One, two, three! Rangers! Swing the bat, guys. Swing the bat today. A lot of strikes. He's going to throw a lot of strikes. The tournament started July 1st. We had, uh, I think, 68 teams that participate over a six-week period. It's been some really great baseball. Uh, we've seen teams from as far as Queens, uh, Nassau County, Suffolk County. Coach, it's nice to be part of 9-11 tournament. As coach, do you take time to explain what happened on 9-11 to the kids? As we go to the skills competitions, we will let them know about it, let them understand it. Maybe, you know, because obviously none of them were born when it happened. So just give them a reminder and, uh, if, you know, what a great country we live in. Absolutely. They all know what went down and they all know what the tournament's about. Your kids started off a little nervous, a little shaky. What do you do to keep their heads in the game? Just gotta tell them that it's a fun game. Go out there and enjoy it, relax, and, and just have fun playing baseball. It's what they love to do. So. what they're having for dinner tonight and forgetting all about baseball. <laughs> because you, you can't just keep talking baseball. They talk baseball, it just, just puts pressure on it. We started the first couple of games, we wouldn't have thought we'd be in this spot this time of the year. The kids, the kids earned this. These kids earned this. They did a great job. Go, 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 After a rough start, both sides buckled down and turned in some defensive gems. The Rangers took a commanding early lead. Then the Green Dogs started chipping away at it and found themselves just one run down on their final at bat. The Green Dogs tie the game and the crowd gets treated to free baseball. It's a nothing, nothing game. Let's start over. That was a nice play, my man. Let me get it in fast. Let's go. We're still in this thing. Let's go. Next inning. After three extra innings, it's the parents that are feeling the pressure. This is a nail biter. It's terrible, terrible. Go green dogs. Terrible, terrible, green dogs. terrible in a good way. Oh, it's a nail biter. Heart attack. We're holding up. We're holding up. We're ready to roll right now. This is where it's all about. <laughs> How's your heart? It's it's pumping. Oh, it's a good one, huh? Aside from the fact we're divorced, we're holding up pretty good. <laughs> but you were married in the first inning. All right, I, I got you on that one. Oh, this trouble right there. Finally, the Rangers strike. They take a one-run lead and find themselves three outs away from being the champs. Nice and easy. We got to run, but we got to play defense. Got to play defense, fellas. Let's go, boys. A lot of game left. A lot of game left. Down but not out in the bottom of the inning, the Green Dogs put two runners in scoring position. Infield fly and the tying run stays at third. Swing and a miss. The Green Dogs are down to their final out. One run in and the game is tied again. A second run scores and the Green Dogs win the championship in walk-off fashion.
Yeah, that was a stressful game. We met them four times this year, and every game was pretty close. Three extra innings, I mean, doesn't get better than that. Feels good to be the champ. This year was great because other towns helped us out with some fields. Seaford was big. Uh, East Meadow, so we were able to expand the tournament. We're really working together to get this thing done for the right reason. Well, that's our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. You can friend us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter, or you can email your story ideas to stories at mylitv.com. Remember, you can watch this show and many other award-winning videos at mylitv.com. In the meantime, enjoy your Long Island and tune in to see where we go next on My Long Island TV.